Hi everyone, I'm just uh, putting in the comment and then I will look up Murray. I'll be right there. Uh, is that in there? Getting started in a few minutes. Post. Pin. All right. Now. Array. Add. I think. Hey. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Ray. I'm just trying to set my, of course, I had this all organized before, you know. Oh, technology. And now I'm trying to, uh, yeah. Okay. Hi, Marie. Hello, Jonathan. How are, How are you? you? I feel very close to the screen, to be honest. Let me just <laughs> move that. <laughs> okay. Well, here we are. My big head. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jonathan Shaughnessy, Associate Curator of Contemporary Art at the National Gallery of Canada. And welcome to uh, House Blend Live. A weekly program on Instagram Live uh, at the National Gallery of Canada's Instagram page where National Gallery curators speak with our colleagues um, and uh, about, you know, topics to date that have had to do with our work at the gallery at this time of COVID-19 when we're all working from home. But uh, the ambition was always to uh, also move outside of the gallery. And we're doing that this week for the first time with my Invite today, uh, my guest, Mary Egan, uh, who is the uh, curator of contemporary art at the Rooms uh, Museum and Art. Uh, what's the Provincial Art Gallery Museum and Archives, I believe? Is how You're right. It. There we are. Um, and, uh, and she's going to give a more formal introduction to herself in a minute. But I wanted to, um, to start by welcoming everybody and... Uh, just to let you know that we're um, we're usually here at 3 p.m., but uh, exceptionally today we uh, move the presentation to 2 p.m. because Jonna Comfra, who we're going to be speaking in part about today, will be uh, part of a panel discussion um, it, through, and I'm going to give the link to that at the end of our discussion, Murray, um, through a talk uh, with Listen Gallery um, that I'm also looking forward to. So we're going to move on to that after this. So I'll, I'll give you the details. And um, of that, um, I just wanted to start because uh, I'm in Ottawa, Gatineau, uh, so is the National Gallery of Canada. Um, and so uh, I'm not sure where everybody is out there in the uh, Instagram <laughs> universe. Um, but for us, that means that we're, um, we find ourselves on the unceded territories of the Algonquin peoples. And I want to take this moment to acknowledge the keepers of this land since time immemorial. Uh, and uh, really what is a beautiful part of uh, this corner of the world. So, um, and I know, Murray, uh, you and St. John's, uh, I wanted to ask if you had a, um, something to do with specific reference to Newfoundland. Yes, uh, we respectfully acknowledge the province of Newfoundland and Labrador as the ancestral homelands of many diverse populations of Indigenous peoples who have contributed to 9,000 years of history, including the Beothic on the island of Newfoundland. Today, this province is home to diverse populations of Indigenous and other people. We would also like to acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of the Mi'kmaq, the Innu, and the Inuit. Thank you. And uh, I also wanted to, um, to just say a few words uh, that uh, something I did when I gave a tour at the gallery on Saturday, um, just uh, to acknowledge also um, the long history of, um, of uh, communities, Black communities, Black histories in Canada um, that go back to the 17th century in this country um, and are part uh, intimately connected with Canada's colonial history and transatlantic history uh, and some of the subjects that we'll be getting into um, today, Murray, through John Comfer's work. Um, it's a long history. Uh, it's one that's entrenched in the history of this country. And it's also one that you don't see uh, very visibly at all in many of the major um, art and museological institutions uh, in this country, and that would include the one where I work. Um, there is much work to be done in that regard, and I wanted to take the opportunity uh, to, along with the National Gallery, uh, 
his messaging and their thanks to those who have commented in the last few weeks uh, about um, the gallery's response to recent events. And just to let people know that uh, as curators, we're part of the community. Um, I certainly read many of those comments with, uh, well, read them and, uh, and know uh, also some of the individuals uh, and their concerns. So it, it does fold into dialogues that are ongoing at the gallery. And, um, and this is something that uh, didn't start last week, but it certainly um, has been um, placed front and center um, given uh, the current moment. Uh, and Murray, on that, I um, also wanted to then uh, move in because I think that where, what we're gonna talk about today has a lot to do with histories that are not seen or that were even for the grand majority of, you know, within the history books of Canada, um, seem to come, you know, are, are not visible. And, um, and that's going to be through both uh, John Comfer's Vertigo Sea and also uh, an exhibition that you worked, well, that were curated by Bushra Junaid that you're going to speak about as well at the rooms. But before that, I thought that um, I, uh, I've known you for some time uh, and had the good fortune to, uh, to visit St. John's and the rooms uh, when we were working together on the Mary Pratt exhibition that came to the National Gallery and your show prior uh, that traveled. Um, and uh, so hello to the community uh, in and around St. John's and also uh, uh, other parts of Newfoundland. Um, so I thought we might start by, uh, could you just give us a bit more for those who don't know you, a little bit more about your background and how you came to the rooms and your formation as a curator as well? Um, well, I'm curator of contemporary art at the rooms. I've been there about 10 years, as you mentioned. And before that, I was a curator at the Confederation Centre Art Gallery in PEI. Um, so I'm very much an Atlantic kid, you know, raised in, raised in New Brunswick, studied at Mount Allison art history, and then went to Concordia for art history. But um, basically my job at the rooms is to tell stories about this place that we're the symbolic, we're basically, we're the symbolic institution of this province. You know, we tell it, we reflect stories of this place back to uh, visitors, to people um, of this place. And my job is to listen. My job is to listen to what people, to what artists are making and stories that are happening and uh, also to, to share those through art objects. And yeah, and I, I think that you and the, um, I mean, we're gonna talk about the show you have up now, but you've, you've spent a lot of time also uh, discussing the history of, of uh, Newfoundland through both modern art and contemporary works. I, I know you, you've done a couple of major projects. I think it was a two part project. Yes, I did. A, it was called Future Possible, and it was writing the art history of this province. The term Future Possible is a, a verb tense that this individual called Andy Jones, Andy Jones um, had for the province, where he believed that we, we move forward. It's future possible, possibly horrible. It's the idea that mm. even no matter what, it's going to be bad. But ultimately, there wasn't an art history written. Not really. So this was the chance to do so. But it was also the chance for us as an institution to really think reflexively uh, and thoughtfully about what history looks like, the form that it can take. Um, and so we've been bringing in researchers and artists to really look at our collections because we have the archives, the museum, and the art gallery, as you mentioned, um, with different ideas of objecthood and histories. Um, we wanted these individuals, these people, to, to be a part of a larger discussion about what history looks like. And, and Bush Janaid was one of that, was one part of that. Um, okay. Got to come for also also part of that in a way, um, right? Well, yeah. um, well, we're we're gonna. Get, I mean, I just uh, there was one other thing before we get to kind of the the meat of the matter, if you will, um, which was uh, I guess for some of you, uh, some people might have seen you. The CBC has recently, or at least at the start of our, you know, uh, COVID um, working at home scenarios, uh, went across the country or was going across the country, um, but you were the first to uh, be interviewed about curators and what they missed from their collections. And I thought maybe uh, it would be nice if you shared uh, what your response to the CBC was to that question. Yeah, there's a benefit to being as far east as you can get. <laughs> yeah, so they... <laughs> they ask you first. <laughs> <laughs> so basically it was, I was looking at our collections under the theme of isolation. Um, and I brought together artists like Rod Pelli, who's from St. John's, N Annette Pratt is a Newfoundland artist, um, and then Shivanaya Shuna to explore those themes. Um, but I, my cat also showed up. Um, a few times. <laughs> it's kind of the nature of it. But uh, I wanted to, 
basically talk about the isolation that is associated with this province. So they consider it to be geographically isolated, but in fact, this province is a, very much a part of local, national, and international conversations, which is why an artist like Shivanaya Shuna was included mm -hmm. in that. Um, yeah, well, it, and it's there too. It, it's it's posted so people can go and have a look. But I, yeah, Shuvanai, I mean, when I saw that as well, just thinking about Shuvanai Shuna in those discussions, um, an artist well represented in the National Gallery's collection, um, but also I think the way that Shuvanai speaks to particular issues in the North, emphasizing how these are not specific issues to the North or to Canada, but rather global yes. issues uh, that are linked up to broader global histories. Um, and um, colonial histories, uh, empire. I think that this is a nice segue into what we're going to be talking about today. And, and when we were speaking in the French uh, post cafe just now, um, you were you were saying that really it is a mandate of the rooms to start with the place, but then those these these histories are tied in both the rooms and how it's placed in Canada, but also more broadly um, in the world. Oh yeah, it's a, it's a definitely a, a telescopic approach. So it's it's always the the keystone is always the local, the stories of this place. But then it is you know how Newfoundland again is not isolated. Newfoundland and Labrador is are not isolated. Um, we are we are connected to extended histories um, of of colonialism, of trade, of economics. Um, of you know we're not we're we're on the ocean. We're connected in that way. So it's. But part of it is, is uh, you know, what's interesting and I'm bringing us kind of back to the exhibitions on display is also how little we know about those histories and how, uh, you know, how much work we do have to do in terms of our own collections and our own institutional approaches to those that are, it's, it's really fascinating. Shall we, shall we start then by uh, the, what we've been talking about over the last year or so or more was um, your, uh, your desire on behalf of the rooms to show this work by John Acumfra, Vertigo C. Um, and uh, it's a three channel video installation. I will just um, move my phone slightly to get an image because I wanted to say a few words just to set up the context for people that may not be as familiar. Um, it's a work that, um, were, that came into the National Gallery's collection uh, a few years ago. It was shown in the uh, 2017 Canadian Biennial. That's just a catalog for this. It was actually shown in Alberta because the Canadian Biennial of that year was in Ottawa in the National Gallery. And then we had a exhibition at the same time at the Art Gallery of Alberta. Um, and then it will be shown in Ottawa at the National Gallery. We're planning hopefully sometime uh, after next March. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, of course, now it's it's with you uh, in Newfoundland at the rooms. And uh, just, uh, just a few images. So it's a three-channel video installation. I mean, this isn't showing you. You can also Google it, of course, and find out a little bit more. Um, but I wanted to sort of situate just for a few minutes uh, the artist and this work. Um, oh, and uh, sorry, the also a really nice image I didn't show, which you can keep in mind as I'm reading and talking, is uh, this one scene of, um, uh, you know, a, a looks like a captain or a navigator uh, overseeing this, uh, well, really what could be part of your corner of the world, <laughs> right, um, in this, in the catalog. And, um, and it's just to say that uh, Vertigo C was filmed in numerous different sites, but one was off the far, far north coast of Newfoundland on the uh, North Atlantic. And uh, so there is a resonance to, to place uh, quite directly with this work. Um, but moreover, I just, uh, again, just to kind of, and I'll, I'll stick to a few notes that were actually written by um, my colleague, uh, former colleague at the gallery, Rhiannon Vogel, who did a lot of research on this piece. Um, but just to let you know, John Acumfra is a prolific artist and filmmaker based in London, England. Uh, he was born uh, in Accra, Ghana. He came to England in uh, 1966. And his film career, uh, looking, I mean, he came to the UK at a time of heightened uh, tensions, race, racial tensions, racism in the 1970s, and found his voice through experimental art, uh, well, art and experimental film as a part of that. And he founded the Black Audio Film Collective in 1982, and he debuted his film, first film uh, to much critical acclaim, Hansworth Songs, four years later in 1986. And that was dealing with Hansworth and race riots in 1985. There's been riots um, uh, in Hansworth uh, since then, um, every half a decade or so. And of course, it's a film that resonates, um, uh, unfortunately, for very, you know, today still. And just to let you people know that to that end, 
uh, this film is being screened until June 21st at Listen Gallery website. So you can see it in its entirety. So it's, a, it's something that um, if you're interested, you should see. Um, and he's known for his social activism, always been a very uh, socially committed artist. Um, and his work explores themes of memory, post-colonialism, and investigates diasporic identities, migration, racism, and many, many other topics, including in Vertigo C, uh, a real strong interest in recent, well, throughout, but uh, certainly more recently on uh, the environment and, uh, and that as being also another global issue of ultimate concern. Um, rather than working as a traditional documentary filmmaker, uh, his role as an artist allows him to present history as something unresolved rather than a tidy narrative to needle at uncertainty, nuance, and discrepancy, and to deal with textures of mood, sound, and image without committing to easy interpretation. His nonlinear, often multi-screen works incorporate archival footage, media clips, and voiceover, uh, countering the canons of commercial cinema, while his insistence on high production values and using the latest in digital film technologies puts his work at the level of any major blockbuster. I think that's one thing about Johnny Comfer's work, that they're just sensational, uh, even though um, they are very much made for uh, galleries and a dialogue and, a, you know, a dialogue with the art world and the world. Um, but, uh, but they're, they're just incredibly visually rich to watch and to take in. And we can talk about that, Maria, I hope. Um, in terms of Vertigo C, uh, the work itself was presented for the first time at the, um, 56 Venice uh, Biennale, um, and to much, I mean, acclaim. Uh, that was the late Okuyen Wazor's All the World's Futures uh, Biennale, um, where uh, his, his um, Wazor's curatorial premise was looking at the ruptures that surround and abound around every corner of the global landscape today, and uh, the question of how can the current disquiet of our time be properly grasped, made comprehensible, examined, and articulated. And so for, and I won't go on much longer, Marie, because I want to hear from you, but I wanted to set the scene of, of a Vertigo C. Um, within the work, you have these three channels, and uh, Comfer is referencing archives, uh, because he works with archives, um, uh, archival sources that have a lot to do with the ocean as a place of violence, historically, from the triangular trade uh, of slave routes. Uh, so from slavery um, onwards to the whaling industry, to environmental destruction, and even within the, the video or the film, you see um, uh, mention of uh, nuclear fission, uh, you know, and basically we get a sense of even that, that humanity has created the tools to destroy us all. Um, but within that, there are sumptuous and sensual scenes of the ocean being reborn, uh, birds in flight, um, you know, these kind of vistas that were provided by the BBC natural uh, footage from the BBC uh, what, natural history specials, I think. And um, so you kind of get this, yeah, amalgam of sublime beauty and, and violence. And it almost becomes, and I'd be curious to know, Mary, what people are, then when they encounter it, are thinking because you get caught up in a beauty and then you see the most horrific scenes. And so within that, I think, um, you know, that is Vertigo C. And, so that's, that's just to setting the scene, Murray. And can we just, I mean, I don't know if you want to respond just to the work first and foremost, and maybe say why it was so important to bring it to the, the rooms. It, I mean, it resonates here. It, you look at that film and, and um, the installation and what it describes, what it goes through, not only in terms of the presence of the ocean um, for us, uh, but also the histories of colonialism, the uh, whaling, um, sealing, all of these, all of these are part of the history and the cultural imagination of this place. And so you, you walk into that space and you go, yeah, it belongs here. And uh, the response to it is, is, is quite, it's, I mean, it's such a powerful film. It's, it's such a powerful experience that we actually had to move a Kleenex box into the space to be oh, frank. Wow. Because, uh, yeah, it was, um, it, it gets to you. Um, but the response is really interesting in, in so many ways. I mean, because, you know, not only does, like I say, does it resonate, but it does also, people are shocked um, by the province's connection to the history of the of slavery within the transatlantic trade. Um, it's uh, it, to, the, to the point that they, they almost feel embarrassed by that, being a part of, you know, how this province might be known. But um, the, the film is so, it's so, uh, effective. It's so generous and thoughtful in terms of how it goes through um, those various narratives um, and which are, of course, explored in what carries us alongside that. Mm -hmm. It's uh, yeah, it's, a, it's wonderful to have it here. 
It makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I'll just I want to I want to get to um, to what carries us uh, as well very quickly. Um, just to mention that in terms of um, because just facilitating the loan and working through all of the details and everything, um, this was something that uh, I, I had the chance to see this work also in Margate on the west southwest coast of England, where Turner, um, uh, the British painter Turner, nineteenth century painter. Um, uh, resided and at, uh, at uh, Turner Contemporary and there Turner's been a huge um, influence to the way that um, Acomfra, um thinks through the visual palette of his work and of course a work specifically with with Vertigo C uh, the slave ship uh, the Turner painting from 1840 that's in the Montreal or the, <laughs> the Museum of Fine Arts Boston collection probably one of their most noted uh, historical paintings um, you know that that work which was created by Turner after a graphic and quite public episode of a slaver, you know, killing slaves at sea uh, and, um, and turning some tide of public perception towards slavery in the era of Queen Victoria. And um, so that particular work comes in as a reference among many others within, within this film. And so uh, alongside all the Turners at, at, at Turner Contemporary, um, John Acumpera had presented Vertigo Sea and there it was on one side of the Atlantic and you know, I remember being there a few years ago and thinking this has to come to where you are, Murray, and on the other side of the Atlantic, you know, and, and, uh, and was thankful to be able to have that exchange with the artist uh, on uh, a number of occasions that I've run into him, you know, at, at places in the art world. So I think it's very special and important. Um, and, uh, but I know too, that for you, for me, that was, you know, uh, uh, something that I thought would be a great context for this work in the National Collection. But for you, you already had thought this through and had plans for it that got was intimately connected to uh, this exhibition, What Carries Us, that you worked with um, uh, Bushra Junaid. And so maybe, yeah, can you please introduce that? No, it was in the air. I, I, in fact, Bushra approached us um, yeah. to say, this film needs to be here. This needs to be here. Uh, so Bushra Junaid uh, was you know, born in the Caribbean, raised in Newfoundland, and now lives in Toronto. She's an artist and curator. Um, and she had created an exhibition down at Eastern Edge uh, previously talking about the transatlantic, or sort of the history of Newfoundland and uh, Caribbean relations. Um, but here, as part of a, a longer thing that we're doing where we're bringing in researchers and artists to look at our collections, is she came in. Um, and spent some time looking through our archives, our museum, and our art gallery objects, and um, frankly found very little, which was actually fascinating. There, there were so few documents, um, and so few images, so few objects. So uh, this show became What Carries Us, um, is about that lack of history. It's, it's, it's trying to fill in that, that gap uh, through um, an um, African diasporic perspective is provided by Bushra, and she brings together artists like Sandra Brewster, Shelley Miller, and Camille Turner, as well as the British artist Sonia Boyce, um, to, to place, place them alongside historical objects from the museum collection, the art gallery collection, and the archives. And um, it, what she's effectively showing um, is not only that, that John Acomfer relates to this place, um, but also, like I say, that this is just the beginning of uncovering histories um, of this place that relate to um, the Afro-Caribbean uh, connection. Can you, um, yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, regret because, uh, well, when you were opening that show, COVID came later, but you were, you pushed the opening because St. John's was under another state of emergency for a snowstorm, I recall, <laughs> and everything was, talk about chaos. And so uh, I know, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get out there and now won't be able to see, I, I doubt the show, but there is documentation online um, and, uh, and there, that stuff available. Um, can you go in a little bit more to that, that premise of the show? I know that, um, you know, Paul Gilroy, The Black Atlantic is a touchstone for the premise, the curatorial premise. And I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how the show, um, I guess, you know, I, I'm thinking about Canada has, you know, not seen itself, if I can talk about just as a nation, like the, the discourse of nationhood um, necessarily is tied within the, um, the premise of the Black Atlantic as Paul Gilroy lays it out as the triangular trade that connects all of the Americas. And, um, and the narrative has been a bit different in Canada um, with relation to slavery, with relation to um, uh, African um, peoples who were first here. So. Uh, yeah, I just wondered how Paul Gilroy comes in and uh, to the premise of the show and if you could speak a little bit more about that. 
Uh, Paul Gilroy, the, the term the Black Atlantic is part of the title of the exhibition. Um, mm -hmm. So what carries us, Newfoundland and Labrador in the Black Atlantic. Um, but what, it, what Busher is doing is looking at those connections that exist culturally um, and in terms of economic ch um, exchange between this province and between uh, well, Europe and um, the Caribbean and Africa. Um, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating because of... Uh, Things that are so common um, as part of the art his of their history of this place, for instance, the trade of cod or the inca the uh, uh, molasses that was traded for cod um, as part of this place, you know, is uh, is tied to that history. It's it was low grade cod was sold uh, to the Caribbean to uh, feed um, slaves and later indentured workers. But also what comes up through this exhibition, and particular, uh, in particular through Camille Turner's uh, work, um, are records of slave ships that were built here, or records of, of slaves that came to this province. So this, uh, this space that Camille Turner has created, this Afronautic Research Lab, is a place where visitors go in and examine that history, or what history exists. And what it is, is it's showing visitors that um, you know, we all have to take responsibility for learning this. And it isn't necessarily about feeling poorly about this, um, but that it is, it is an opportunity to just really consider the responsibility that we have, not only as individuals, but as institutions. Well, I think, I think yeah. And, and when you mentioned, uh, and it came up in our, the, our French talk as well, uh, that if Bushra is looking and finding not a lot uh, to begin with, um, you know, that this sort of speaks to these these institutions in which we work and, you know, the histories that have been visible. I mean, the histories that are there, things that have been kept, things that have been deemed worth keeping. Um, you know, this is part of the story of what needs to be unpacked now and, uh, you know, what's, what we're thinking about and what needs to go on critically. And also, what can we, I think a lot about um, some of the works in the National Gallery's collection uh, that may, that represent Canadian art history, but how have we looked at them? Um, you know, whether it's a, uh, a scene of a merchant ship uh, docking, or if it's, you know, and, it, and have we sort of looked at what the major histories, what, what are the histories going on around these objects, even if, you know, because uh, they speak to, in some cases, the erasure of voices. Um, and uh, so I think that as a theme is important and certainly important right now and always. There was an object in uh, the show uh, that is something also I realize there's very little known about it, but it was by a person called WH. And I, I know that's something that was central to the exhibition. Yes, uh, it's the introduction to the exhibition. I'll, I'll show you an image. Mm, okay. Uh, so this is, these are the items. Um, okay. These were the um, objects found at a burial site in Labrador. Um, they were buried there in the 1800s, and uh, they're, um, they were later discovered, based on archaeological evidence, to be the clothing of a, a young black man. Um, we don't know very, we don't know very much beyond that. It's an um, it's an amazing find um, in the museum collection, but the clothes are of fine quality. Um, WH is scraped into the bottom of the shoe and into a knife handle. And be, like, like I say, beyond that, we, we don't know much, except for he was buried with a pair. Um, he wasn't buried at sea, but uh, Bushra discovered this um, in our collection. But when, when she, she wanted, so she wanted to include it um, as part of this, is an introduction to the fact that, um, again, this history, there's so little known about this history, but it's, it's a remarkable find. Yeah. And, and uh, as you say, I mean, I guess it, it, it's just interesting that it, it ended up, do we know how it got into the holdings of the archives? Um, is it, it was really an anomaly of just something that is there. I know it's, um, it was originally, so it was, it was brought in through the museum. I think it was held at Munn for a while as well. Okay. Uh -huh. um, yeah, but it's, it, it's, it was displayed there for, at Munn for quite some time and then brought into uh, the holdings at the rooms. But again, it, you know, it took, it, it takes people like, like Busher Janae, it takes others to, to be, to really, it's wonderful when this happens, when someone comes in and finds objects that have been there for so long um, and then really brings them into the discussion. And the response to these objects has been amazing. I, I really hope it's, it sparks um, extended research and discussions about, about this history and about this individual. Is it, it, it sounds like with this exhibition, uh, it's the first of what could be a number of, of shows. 
Uh, I don't know if that's, you know, I, I presumably, did you feel too that it was the start of, I mean, the start of a conversation and, you know, you can only say so much in one exhibition ever or in one, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I should say, because uh, we're coming up, we wanted to talk for about a half an hour. Um, the, uh, I guess you're closed, the rooms at the moment. Um, you'll be uh, reopening uh, June 29th. June 29th, and uh, the show goes, is at, What Carries Us Up is, is up until September 6th, and John and Comfort is up until uh, July 29th, I believe, or July 28th. 20 28th or 29th, but yeah, you can consult that, so you'd have a chance um, to, for people to see that. Had there been before, um, just to maybe go back to John and Comfort a little bit, I mean, I, I, how had it been before you had to close? I don't, I think, I guess it was only open for probably not even a month before, unfortunately, yeah. the doors. Just a few weeks, so we're we're very happy to be able to extend it so that people can view it. Right, right, yeah. What about you? Like, what's your? Um, I mean, we were talking a little bit about the content in that work, uh, and uh, some of the the ways it engages with multiple narratives, with memory, with history. There's also these these um, these scenes where it's just sort of as though it were a shipwreck or something, just furniture and things strewn on, uh, you know, on the 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 coast. And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm curious about your reading of, of the work a little bit more, like in terms of um, your responses now having, because you've seen it more recently than me, <laughs> in a way, because you've had that chance. I'm, I'm jealous. I've watched it repeatedly, too. It's, uh, yeah, it, it's so powerful. Um, and and it's, for, for me, it's, it's interesting, because there's no linear narrative to it. it, you know, that it is the past and the present are alongside each other. Um, and these really beautiful juxtapositions that occur with someone standing on the shore, um, a, a polar bear being murdered, a, a man sitting alone, uh, talking to himself, um, a clock ticking. Um, but for me, it is that the, the, the way that John Comfort really explores how the form the history can take. That's that's fascinating to me, um, and it's it's an immersive, very powerful work. Um, it's you can't help but feel that it's both beautiful and horrifying, and how destabilizing that is. So it's um, but it's really yeah, wonderful. Just... Sorry, <laughs> I was just gonna say it's wonderful because you know you talk about the shipwreck. These these are these this individual standing on the shore. You showed that photo earlier. Um, all those objects are again in what carries us. So, mm. oh, okay. Yeah, it's yeah. beautiful. Yeah, it sounds like programming wise that it really is, uh, you know, and, and in a way, you know, again, thinking about the dialogue and I know, um, you know, what you can do in a gallery uh, situation between artists that, you know, and also, uh, well, I want to think back of the premise too of, of the Black Atlantic, at least in Paul Gilroy's kind of, because that's a, that's a text that's going back a few decades now, right? It's been very influential, but the idea there was him breaking, you know, at the time trying to break through an idea of just um, African diasporic identity being rooted in one particular nation where, uh, where someone might find themselves and, and loosening that up to a global reading. And I think, uh, because, you know, in revisiting that work, um, thinking about how that work could be done uh, from a perspective of Canada, you know, you could almost take that thesis and then say, well, hold on a second, like, how does that work here? Um, and it sounds like that's where you're getting to and what you're doing. Um, and, uh, and I wonder, too, maybe the last question I have for you uh, for now would be, you know, I work in an institution that has a art collection, um, and to a certain extent, well, it has an archive, but it's not an archive it's an archive around the works that we have in the collection. Um, so you work in a museum. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that, you know, a fine art institution, and I think the National Gallery uh, and many other fine art institutions in that way are trying to now, especially, and this has been a lot of work that's been done through uh, our colleagues and the Department of Indigenous Art and the collection there of thinking about, well, what is the status of that fine art object? What does that mean today? What does it mean about what hasn't been collected historically? Um, but you work in an institution where I guess you, you do have a collection of objects that may not have been deemed fine art uh, through the Western Academy. Um, and so do you find that that's freeing in a way to be able, even if there's objects that are not visible, but to be able to bring in a variety of, of um, and across times? Oh yeah, it's fascinating. Like you know, I call myself a curator of contemporary art, but I'm interested in what that 
term means in terms of being a curator, um, but also what contemporary is. And um, uh, uh, something that I've explored constantly in my curatorial practice is how the past continues to resonate. And that can be seen by bringing in historical objects and placing them alongside contemporary artworks and really drawing out or uh, making a space where it can be drawn out um, questions about, about what history looks like. And um, with, working, with having the archives, having the museum um, in the same building as the art gallery, there's all these different ideas that can exist um, about objecthood, about histories, about objectivity when it comes to histories. And um, it's, a, it's really fascinating and fertile ground to exist in. It's, yes. Well, I know the work you've been doing. I think, uh, you know, uh, I um, and I look forward to all the work that is yet to come. Uh, and I think I don't I think we maybe there's questions if anybody has a question or two. The one thing I might ask, uh, which relates to some something that has been said is how uh, is the work, uh, I guess, uh, even some of the themes in John Acumfra addressed through the panel text and stuff. Are you quite specific about the histories that it points to and Canada or Newfoundland's place within it? Um, yes, we are. It, it, the, the, well, Bushra is, and she did a wonderful yeah. job of, of really contextualizing John Acumfra and also um, the works uh, throughout her exhibition. But she starts with the personal, which is, I really, really love. She talks about her connection to this province, her, um, what it was like for her to grow up here, and why it is important for her to, uh, to really uncover this history. Um, and then she extends it to uh, Newfoundlanders and who know their history well, who, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians who know their history well, um, but, um, but points to the fact that, yes, there's still lots to uncover. And that throughout, she will tell the story of the transatlantic trade um, and uh, in a really uh, generous way, um, describing the history of the objects, but also poetically drawing out um, how it relates to ideas of history and uncovering that history. Great. Thank you. Um, good. Well, uh, one other question was a very specific one about where uh, people can see uh, Hansworth songs, and that is at the Listen Gallery. So John Acumfra's gallery, Listen Gallery, uh, their website. Uh, it's their feature up until June 21st. They're doing screenings. Uh, another one of the creative ways that galleries are trying to stay active while their spaces are closed. So I was really pleased to see that that was there. And um, and I think uh, otherwise, what I was going to do. Oh, uh, oh. <laughs> there is. Uh, la, la. Uh, so that was the one about the other. He's seeing how a lot of colonial monuments have been taken down. What are the monuments you would take down in your institutions? Well, there. Do you want to touch oh, that one? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, have you frozen? Uh oh. oh Hold on. Ah. Am I here? There? Yeah, you're there. <laughs> Sorry, I think we're, I don't know who's Andy. You never know with these things, who's, who's Wi-Fi. Oh, I think they may be having some trouble. Oh, no. Murray. Gosh. Okay, I think that what I'll do is... What I'm going to do if and if you're still there, is, can people still hear me? I don't know if it's frozen. Maybe just give me a thumbs up or something. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I mean, there's so much that in the historical collection of the National Gallery we could talk about. Um, oh, and there's Murray. Um, and I think it's one second. Let me just find her. Uh, hold on. Murray, are you coming back? <laughs> What I was going to do was also um, mention, and I will get to the question, but uh, oh, there you are. Hi, sorry. Just, um, I was that, but uh, also, well, at the end, I'm going to post the talk that John Acumfra is doing and the link to that at three o'clock. Um, but yeah, this question of, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think about it because of course I don't work also in the historical, I'm in contemporary art. And so 
you know, I, I think that this is a question that at the National Gallery, um, I think that it is being looked at. I mean, how do we look at these objects? I mean, I can't think of a monument as such like a, you know, there's the statue of Champlain behind the gallery, which could come up as a topic of conversation, but that's not the galleries, that's a national monument in Ottawa. Um, and uh, in terms of the gallery itself, we have a collection on the walls. And I think what I was trying to say earlier was that the way I've been thinking is that, you know, there are objects, for example, and Marie, we talked about this a little bit, a uh, tradition of view paintings, as they've been called, that, you know, are part of Canadian art history. Um, I don't think that any are so, you know, that they're sort of um, a genre, which maybe aren't the best known. But these are these are paintings that were quite in the market uh, in the uh, 18th century and onwards um, for laying out land and land surveying. And, you know, you see these on the side walls of the gallery. And of course, now, at the National Gallery with Indigenous artworks throughout in, in the dialogue. But then coming upon these, I've been thinking a lot about how are we articulating those particular paintings. And again, this is, you know, just uh, conversations I have with my colleagues in historical Canadian art. And are these being looked at as, you know, a part of Canadian art history that are interesting paintings of a landscape back then? Or are they seen as, you know, part of a colonial uh, archive of documents that were about land surveying, about seeing you know, what land was being uh, appropriated, excommunicated, taken over uh, and built upon. And so I think there, you know, um, those are, I would say, quite loaded documents, even if they are not put out that way, um, that could be engaged in ways that I think elucidate some of these uh, concerns um, right now. Um, Ray, did you have a chance to... Uh... Oh, no, I, I, I agree with you. And I, I did like how the question put monuments in quotation marks, because I think, oh. you know, it's, it's, it's really describing these uh, objects as, as some part of a symbolic history. And so when I think about monuments, I also think about, you know, the, the very forms of how our institutions operate. Um, you know, yeah. so you said it perfectly, like, how do we approach those objects? How do we frame them? Um, and also, uh, how do we how do we create a scenario or a space for discussions to occur? Um, that is self-reflexive, that isn't afraid to be wrong, you know, that as institutions, we're, that's, the monuments for me are the, the forms of how our institutions operate and the forms of how we um, discuss those, discuss objects. So it's, it's ongoing. Yeah, but I no, think that's a really good listening. Yeah. way to put it, you know, and I think that, um, yeah, and, and maybe we, we leave it at that. And I'm just thinking, I, I brought up Champlain, but of course we know in Ottawa that there was a, a, a large, uh, well, it's been, I don't know how long ago, but of separating the Indigenous scout, as it were, at the, at the heels of Champlain years ago to be placed in, a, in another area, actually closer to Parliament, um, because that was something, a dialogue that came up a few years ago of looking at even within to a sculpture and a large monument, um, how those were related. And so... Um, and that 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 took that was some years ago, um, Marie. I think there's there's uh, lots more that could always be discussed, but I think that in the interest of time, and uh, I think we could leave it there, um, unless anyone has another last question. Um, but uh, yeah, and um, no, I think that's it. Well, right. Thank you for being a part of House Blend this week. And um, I really do, thanks for taking on this invitation um, and let's keep chatting. And for everyone else, uh, we are continuing to put together the program. Uh, so please stay tuned for next week. We should be uh, announcing um, very soon what uh, uh, we will be speaking about and with whom. And uh, until then, um, please, have a great week and we'll see each other then. So, Murray, uh, what I'll do is I'll say goodbye to you and then I will just post okay. the information on the on uh, where John Comfort will be speaking uh, in about 20 minutes. Okay, okay. perfect. Thank Thanks, you, Jonathan. Murray. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Okay, and uh, so I'll just, as promised, um, go over to... Yeah, so I don't know, it's, sorry, it's interrupted by comments and by, but at least then if you want to take a screenshot, it's Listen Gallery and uh, it's on Zoom, um, but this should give you enough clues to be able to find it. And I don't think there's a registration, it's just simply you click and, um, and watch. Okay, so thanks again, everyone. And uh, we hope to welcome you back in person to the gallery.
soon. And in the meantime, um, we'll see you in formats like this. Okay, bye-bye.